My name is Matthew Hordinski. I'm a senior data engineer at DeepSense AI. And today I would like to take you into the journey uh, to the world of big data and data engineering. Uh, my um, topic of my presentation is real-time analytics at scale. So uh, let's go briefly through our agenda. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we will uh, discuss what is the event-based architecture and why uh, real-time really matters. Then we will dive into um, the problem, the example case study I prepared for you. Uh, we, we learn uh, about the problem that we are facing. And then we will try to solve it with uh, multiple attempts, uh, with more classical approaches. And in the next section, we will look into OLAP databases. Uh, we will learn what OLAP even is. And we will focus on Apache Druid, which is an example of a database from that DB family. And at the end, uh, hopefully, if everything works, uh, we will uh, create running uh, real-time analytics uh, pipeline. Uh, so, uh, what is event-based uh, uh, architecture? To really understand that, we need to know what is an event. So, I would like you to imagine that we are running some online shop. Uh, we are just selling things on the internet. Uh, we have like a commerce website. And uh, we have our users. And let's focus on one user uh, and his journey through our website. Uh, he probably begins by visiting uh, our page, our homepage. And then user may, for example, uh, select the search bar on the top and type something there. For example, uh, he types laptops. Uh, after that, uh, after user receives the results, uh, user might click one of our products and, uh, for example, buy one. And all these actions that user made uh, is called events. And we want to collect them. But as you might suspect, uh, only collecting events is not enough because we are basically saving JSON to hard drives. Uh, it doesn't give us any business value. Uh, we need to understand that events. And to do so, probably we enrich maybe that events with some user profile data. Maybe we run that uh, events through some uh, application logic. Maybe even we have some machine learning uh, model that we uh, pass that data through. And uh, when we take, uh, when we focus maybe on one event, so for example, user typing laptops in the search box, uh, we may gain some information from that. And probably that means that user wants to buy uh, a laptop. And uh, after that, the third and last step is to take an action. Uh, so when we know that user wants to buy a laptop, probably we, we may send a newsletter to him with uh, top rated laptops in our shop. And then maybe, maybe the user will buy a laptop. Mm. And that's the basic idea behind event-based architectures. And I would uh, like to talk a little bit about value of an event. Uh, so the business value of events sometimes can be described as a function of time. Uh, that means when the time passes by, uh, the value, the business value of events decreases. And a really good example here is, uh, let's imagine that we have a food delivery application and uh, we have uh, an event that user searches for pizza. Uh, by the way, this is my photo of pizza from, from Venice. It was, it was really great. Uh, but let's imagine that user, user wants uh, a pizza yeah, right now. And we can, in that moment, respond to that action. For example, we send some uh, push notification to the user with, uh, with the best pizza places out there in our application. And that may lead uh, to, to a conversion. So user uh, buys orders uh, food from our application. But what happens if we uh, respond to that actions after two hours? After two hours of time, probably user is not hungry anymore and uh, probably user went to the restaurant or, uh, or cooked by himself uh, at home. So, um, so, that, so in that case, uh, we can't uh, earn from, from responding to that action. That's why uh, real-time analytics and real-time insights uh, really matters. So let's go to the problem uh, we are facing. Uh, 
uh, let's go back to that example with uh, big online shop. So we are really big. Yeah, we are like millions of users daily. Uh, we are collecting uh, products, listed products on our site from different sellers. Uh, we have different buyers, millions of users daily, thousands of products. Every hour we collect uh, data volumes in terabytes. Yeah. And we mm, actually collecting uh, multiple user event, events and metrics about them. So for example, user products impressions. So every time user goes to some product details page, we count that information. Every time user buys something, we count how many things he bought uh, and what is the revenue. So what is the uh, money we, uh, we earn from that? And for example, um, we collect every, every event of product being added to the basket. And with every event, we are storing extra information. So for example, product category, a user browser, user location, or user device. Uh, it may be only these columns, but it may be maybe 10 of them, 20, even 30, 50. Yeah? So we store a lot of extra data about each event. And um, we want to provide real-time aggregations about events in the system grouped um, at start, let's say, by category and product category and user location. So um, the simplest solution may be to just use a rel relational database. Uh, it's pretty simple because probably we already have one. Uh, if we are running some shop, we probably need some database. So let's use it as our data warehouse, yeah? So we have uh, some fact table with user transactions here, and we run query selecting uh, product category, uh, summing the revenue uh, between some timestamps, and we are grouping it by category. Uh, and what's the problem here? Mm, let's remember we have every hour, we have terabytes of data. And here we are selecting data for a whole day. So this data will be huge and relational databases are pretty slow uh, compared to other tools. And uh, another, another problem here that, uh, is that relational databases are row oriented. So if in this table we have, for example, 20, 30, 50 columns with a lot of data, we read all these columns even when we don't need to. And to, to counter these problems, uh, I've seen companies and in different projects, uh, I've seen to introduce uh, actually two, two things. Uh, it may be aggregation tables or query caches. And let's go to the first one. Mm, so aggregation tables. Uh, what's the basic idea? Mm, the idea here is to uh, have some background process. It may be Airflow, it may be some cron jobs on Kubernetes. Uh, and this process, every time, every, for example, five minutes, five minutes, uh, runs some query, uh, pre-calculating data, and storing it in some uh, aggregation table. In our case, we have aggregation table for user transactions by category, so by product category, uh, in the time windows of five minutes. And uh, of course, the resulting data of that query, so the, the data in the aggregation table, uh, will be a lot smaller than the raw data in user transactions, yeah? But, um, and squaring that table will be a lot faster. But what are the problems? The first one is a little tedious to manage because we need to define schema for that tables. We need to maintain this process running in the background, yeah? Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but we need to maintain it. We need to write it. Uh, it must be monitored uh, and so on. And uh, another problems are what happens if we need to group by another dimension. So uh, let's add here user browser, for example. Uh, there are two different solutions. Maybe we create another table, another background job, and we have uh, two uh, aggregation tables, or we expand that table. But that means we are always grouping by, this, uh, by these two fields, yeah? And sometimes maybe uh, during query time, we need to sum some values. And what happens if we need to change aggregated time window, yeah? So uh, we don't, 
we want to uh, aggregate data in one minute, maybe one minute time windows, then we need to uh, change our logic, probably create new tables and uh, again, pre-calculate data in them. Uh, another solution is to just, um, just query um, the cache, uh, cache the queries uh, that user makes. So just put uh, between user and database, put some cache, yeah? It may be Redis, it, it may be memcached, and uh, we will try to just cache all the queries uh, user makes to our database. For sure, uh, it will speed up the things, uh, it will uh, unload the, the database, mm. but still we have some problems. Uh, so what if underlying data changes? So for example, we had some uh, problem in our database, some out, outage, uh, and, um, uh, and we have stale data in cache. We need to invalidate uh, data in cache. It's, sometimes it's pretty hard. Uh, a lot of bugs comes, uh, comes from uh, stale data in cache. So we need to be really, really uh, we we should really keep that in mind that sometimes it may lead to problems. And in interactive or exploratory use cases, a cache hit ratio may be low. Yeah, if user makes a lot of queries, different ones, uh, different time windows, different filters, uh, sometimes just the cache hit ratio may be very low. Mm, so. Let's look into another family of databases and uh, uh, let's talk about key value stores. So technologies like Cassandra, um, AWS DynamoDB, or maybe InfluxDB. Uh, and they are really, really fast. Yeah, that's the first thing. Uh, they are just, but they are limited. They are pretty fast, but they are limited. We have only keys and values. So that means we need some process to pre-calculate aggregates for uh, each column. And how does it look? Uh, here on the left, uh, we have input table, so our raw data. Uh, and this is uh, event by event, some, some events of uh, users buying stuff on our, on our uh, website. Uh, here for the timestamp column, let's imagine this is some constant. So, for example, today at uh, 3 p.m., uh, something happened. And here we have product category and uh, user city, so user location, and revenue, how much we earned from that, uh, from that transaction. And the idea is to store uh, um, as a key every combination of uh, these three columns and some of the revenue. So, for example, uh, at, uh, at the beginning, we store only the timestamp. So for that timestamp, we sum all these rows and store value here. The next row is timestamp uh, and fashion. So we take the first row and these two rows, uh, we calculate sum from these three rows and we store it in cache uh, as a value in key value store. That's a... Um, Pretty clever solution. Mm, it's it's really fast, and I seen projects uh, using that uh, with with success. Uh, but uh, what are the pro problems? At first, uh, we need to to again maintain that pre calculation. It may fail. Uh, it may be maybe we need to provide some batch logic to recalculate that data if we, if we have failures of calculated it uh, it in real time, and it only it works only for really uh, small data sets. I mean, not small in size by number of rows, uh, but in size by number of columns uh, and uh, how many unique values are in these columns. Because uh, let's imagine if we want to add another column here, we need to uh, basically uh, the, the size of our key value store doubles, yeah? So it's exponential growth on every new split. Mm, okay, so let's go to OLAP databases. And what OLAP uh, really means? It means online analytical processing. Uh, it's a little different from the database we, uh, we are using on day-to-day -day basis. Uh, like 
it's versus OLTP, online transactional processing. Uh, these are the databases we all know, like Postgres, MySQL, and all of that. Uh, and some, some of OLAP databases uh, I wanted to mention here is Apache Druid. Uh, we will focus on that uh, that database, but also here we have Apache Pinot and ClickHouse. They are also pretty popular uh, and uh, pretty awesome, so for sure you can check them out. But let's focus on Apache Druid. So what what uh, what is Apache Druid? Druid is a high-performance, real-time analytics open source database, uh, uh, and its capabilities are that, that Druid can perform query at any scale in milliseconds. Yeah, Even very big queries with, uh, with a lot of data and uh, a lot of dimensions, uh, it should be able to execute uh, that query uh, below one second. Uh, we, it, Druid is very scalable, so we can support from hundreds to thousands of queries per second uh, at consistent performance. And Druid is uh, pretty good both in real time and historical insights. And another very good, a uh, very important feature of Druid is that we can uh, ingest data in real time. Uh, through Druid's native integrations with technologies like Apache Kafka or AWS Kinesis. Uh, so uh, it's pretty good to us because uh, uh, integration with such big data technologies is important to us. And uh, what are the main features of Druid? Uh, I think the, the most important one is roll-up mechanism and how does it work? Mm, so. Let's take a look on our data. Mm, here on the top, we have uh, our, our raw data with orders from our marketplace. Uh, we have timestamp, we have event type. In this example, we have only orders, but it may be multiple event types. We have product category, uh, user city, uh, count. So how many products uh, user buy in that transaction? and how much uh, we earned, so revenue. And uh, how to transform that raw data into Druid data structure. So um, Druid just takes, um, takes all the rows with matching columns. So here we can see the green rows have the same category, product category, electronics, and the events are from Warsaw. So that means Druid can grab all the three events and group them together. And we have uh, some of count and some of revenue. And the same thing, go, thing uh, goes to uh, rows from fashion, from Bitgosh. Uh, and uh, if you look closer to, uh, to the last rows from electronics and from Krakow, uh, they are not grouped together because we specified that we care about uh, query granularity of one minute. And here uh, we have uh, 10, 0, 0, and here we have 10, 0, 1. So that means that Druid uh, don't want to group these rows together because they are from different minutes and we uh, agreed on query granularity of one minute. And by this process, we can make our data smaller uh, from tens to hundreds times smaller. It's pretty powerful. Uh, OK, so after uh, roll-up, uh, we have data sources. And uh, you can think about data sources as like tables uh, in, uh, in different uh, databases. And they are uh, composed of three components. So every data source has a time column, so a timestamp, has a dimensions. Uh, these are these additional uh, extra info about the event. We want to split by them, for example. So in our case, event, product category, and city. And we have metrics. So some business values through it, uh, probably sums them or do some other calculation uh, for the metrics. And what are different uh, metric types? So what are possible calculations for the metrics? Uh, at first, we have basic math. So sum, max, mean, average, uh, pretty basic stuff. Uh, then we have count distinct. 
And this is pretty important. Why uh, do we need them? The discount distinct. Uh, let's look on this example. Mm, here we have uh, extra column user ID, and that column is super unique. Yeah, like every a row has different user ID, and that means Julit can't uh, can't do well on the rollup performance. Yeah, all these rows will be separate after rollup. So we don't want to store columns like this in, uh, in Druid as a dimension. We want to calculate a metric from that. So in our case, we can use count distinct uh, to calculate how many unique users in every uh, city uh, happened. Yeah? So for Warsaw, it will be three unique users. Uh, and just don't store that column as dimension, store it as a metric. And also we have some statistical functions, so like standard deviation or variance, and we have custom aggregations, so we can write our custom JavaScript code to calculate metric for us. And uh, let's go to the live demo. Mm, we are going to build a very simple uh, real-time analytics pipeline. So um, there are three steps and three main components. We have Kafka. You don't need to know a lot about Kafka, but basically it's a, a big pipe of events. So terabytes of JSONs are incoming through some, uh, through some internet connection. Uh, we want to hook up Druid to that Kafka. So Druid starts to listen on that topic, on that big pipe of events and uh, create data source uh, with name orders. And then uh, we want to hook up some data visualization tool. Uh, it's called Turnilo. It's being developed actually by another Polish company, Allegro, right now. Uh, and it's also pretty great. So let's jump in mm, into, into demo. Uh, here I have Apache Druid mm, uh, working on my local machine. And let's go to terminal. Here, as you can see, uh, we have Kafka topic. Uh, a lot of JSONs with different, uh, uh, with data. Mm, so we have timestamp categories, some users ID browser, and so on. Mm, and let's connect uh, this Kafka topic to, to Druid. Uh, I will do so by clicking load, load data and here uh, streaming. And uh, we can select Apache Kafka. This is the native, uh, native integration, but you can, there's a lot more. Uh, and yeah, let's click connect data on the right. And here I need to specify where is my Kafka cluster. In my case, it's on my local machine. So localhost uh, 1992. And uh, what is the name of the topic? In my case, it's orders. And uh, let's apply uh, local host. Yeah, uh, let's apply. And as you can see, uh, Druid connected to my Kafka cluster. I see some, some records here. Let's click next. The next step is to specify input format. So uh, it was done automatically by Druid. Druid figured out that I have JSONs on my, on my topic and uh, it parsed uh, uh, data into columns. Mm, it looks fine, so I can click next. Here, mm, in these steps, we specify where is timestamp column, and here again, Druid uh, did it for, for us. Uh, we have timestamp column in the field named timestamp, and it's in ISO format, so we can go to the next step. And actually, here we have two steps, which I don't care really uh, right now. Uh, we can do some transforms and some filters. That's an option, but right now I don't want to do so, so I will skip these two steps. And here, the important stuff, uh, we have um, the final schema. And in my, uh, in my case, uh, we have this user uh, ID column. And before at the presentation, I, uh, I told you that it's not a good thing uh, in case of Druid because it's too unique. So I want to delete that uh, column as dimension here by clicking trash icon, and I can add uh, it as a metric. Let's enable rollup so that mechanism of compacting rows together and uh, creating aggregation. 
uh, it's appeared again, so I will delete it again, the user ID column. And here I can add metric. Mm, so I want to introduce unique users. I can do it by typing unique users as name. Mm, I will select hyper unique metric type. It's the count distinct uh, algorithm. And uh, in the field name, I will type user ID to uh, to calculate uh, unique user by this column. Let's click apply. Next, go to partition. Here we just select our. It will be okay in our uh, in our example. And here I will click some uh, some things to make it work on pretty small uh, Kafka topic because it's really small. It's just running on my local machines. But here you can tune a lot of things. Yeah, when you have a big pipeline, probably you need to specify these things uh, to, to make them optimal. Then let's uh, keep the data source name to orders and we can submit. And as you can see, we are waiting for this task for running. It's running. We have new Druid data source in a minute, probably. OK, we have uh, our data source, so our table uh, orders. And we can go and start this data visual visualization tool uh, named Turnilo and take a look at our data. Let's refresh that page. And yeah, we have orders here. And we can, for example, query data from latest hour uh, by, let's split by time. OK, let's add some measure for, so for example, count or revenue uh, and split by time. Uh, I see some data here incoming. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, there's incoming data right now. Uh, we can split by category. Uh, and yeah, as you can see, the data is incoming right now. Um, actually, I made a little mistake because uh, we are indexing from, from, from right now, so from 15. But as you can see, the data is incoming right now uh, in a real time manner. Okay, so I think uh, that will be all. So thank you very much and see you next time.